All rise. The International Criminal Court is now in session, hosting the ICC Moot Court Competition 2023 English version. Please be seated. Good morning, everyone. I would like to greet the teams participating. Counsel for the defendant, from the team which is bringing the appeal, counsel for the prosecution, and representatives of the government of Giscar. I want to give a warm welcome as well to the courtroom staff, the security officers who have assisted us in our work, and last but certainly not least, everyone who has taken the time to come to be with us today in the public gallery. The participants as well in the ICC moot court competition attending this hearing. As well as, I should not forget, those persons who are joining us via the internet. I would now turn to the court officer so that the court officer can call the case, please. Thank you. We are sitting in appeal session regarding the pretrial chambers granting of confirmation of charges in the case of prosecution versus uh, call is Valeron of the Republic of Re uh, Regali appeal from the Pretorial Chamber's confirmation of charges ICC moot competition 2023 and English edition. Before we begin, we all know what the procedure is, but before we begin, I should like to tell you two things. One, that is the participants, speak slowly. Two, pause before responding to a question so that everyone can understand and follow. All right, so on behalf of the chamber, I now ask the parties and participants in this hearing to introduce themselves, beginning with the counsel for the defendant. Good morning, Madam President. My name is Maria Mikhailova, and today, along with my co-counsel, Sara Pellegrini, I appear before you on behalf of the counsel for the defendant. Thank you. Counsel for the prosecution, please. Good morning, Your Honors. My name is Rafaela Freitas, and along with my co-counsel, Laura Lira, I appear on behalf of the Office of the Prosecutor. And we have a representative from the government of Giscar. Good morning, Madam President, Your Honors. My name is Marie Voitmans, and together with my co-counsel, Eleni Bukachadze, we represent the Government Council of the State of Giscar. Yes. The team of the registry is represented today by court officers, France Arbesman, as well as Eftaitios Ephraim Yanidakis, sorry, and Priscilla van der Kluft from the Grotius Center for International Legal Studies. Very well. I should have done this at the beginning, but let me do so now. I am the presiding judge in the matter. I am Judge Althea Violet Alexis Windsor. My, the bench is shared by 
Cynthia Chamberlain to my right, and to my left, Farhan Ahmed. All right, so let us now begin to hear the issues shaping the subject matter of today's hearing. I would ask the court officer to please read the agenda established by the appeals chamber. Thank you, Madam President. Pursuant to, uh, to pretrial chamber six decision to grant the defendant's request for leave to appeal the confirmation of charges of 15 September 2022, the appeals chamber six submission of all parties and participants on the following three issues whether the pretrial chamber erred in holding that the state of Giscard's acceptance of jurisdiction concerning international crimes committed in the region of Golden Lowlands was valid given that the territory was no longer apart from Giscard at the time it lodged in its Article 12 free declaration with the registrar, whether the pretrial chamber erred in holding that it had subject matter jurisdiction in this case under Article 7.1K of the ICC statute, and whether the pretrial chamber had erred in holding that there was sufficient evidence to confirm charges against Corlys Valron based solely on the 20 April 2022 report of the International Investigative Commission whose legitimacy was, uh, has been challenged by the UN under Secretary General of the Legal Affairs. Thank you, Madam Court Officer. All right, so the defendant, you have the floor. Good morning again. Madam President, your honors, may it please the court. Today, I appear before you on behalf of the counsel for the defendant. Your honors, it is our position that the pretrial chamber erred in confirming the charges against the defendant. The defense submits three main arguments to support this. First, the court lacks jurisdiction over the alleged offenses as the declaration filed by the state of Giscard under Article 12.3 is invalid. Second, the defendant's alleged conduct does not satisfy the necessary elements required under Article 71K of the Rome Statute. Third, the IAM report is an inadmissible piece of evidence, and in any case, it cannot satisfy the standard of proof under Article 61.7. With your permission, I will proceed with the first submission of the counsel for the defendant, namely that the court lacks jurisdiction and that Giscard's declaration under Article 12.3 is invalid. Yes, proceed. Your Honours, Article 12.3 allows non-state parties to the Rome Statute to file a declaration accepting the court's jurisdiction over crimes which occurred prior to the lodging of the declaration. As we know from the case facts, in April 2022, Giscard filed such a declaration. It attempted to extend the court's jurisdiction over crimes which occurred in the Golden Lowlands in 2019. However, the defense challenges this declaration, arguing that the state of Giscard lacked the power to file it in 2022. This is because the Golden Lowlands, the region in question, became part of another state, Regal, a year prior to the filing of the declaration. As such, by lodging its Article 12.3 declaration, Giscard attempts to exercise jurisdiction over a region which is under the sovereign territory and jurisdiction of another state. However, if we look at the Myanmar decision, uh, the court analyzed that Article 12 is the mechanism through which states delegate their jurisdictional authority, thus allowing the court to exercise jurisdiction in the same circumstances as states do domestically. If we can refer from, from this case, Giscard cannot internationally delegate jurisdiction which it lacks domestically. Specifically, since the territory of the Golden Lowlands is undisputedly part of the state of Rigao, the court cannot establish jurisdiction based on the Giscard's declaration. This is because only Rigao has jurisdiction over the alleged offenses. As such, Council, if I may interrupt, one question, please. Remind me, when 
did the Golden Lowlands become part of uh, your, uh, the state of Regar? Yes, Your Honor. In the 15th of January 2021, the Golden Lowlands seceded from the state of Giscar. And five, five months after that, on the 15th of May 2021, it became part of our state. All right, proceed. To, to conclude, the defense submits that the declaration filed by the state of Giscar is invalid and the court's exercise of jurisdiction in the present case would be an infringement of the sovereign territory of the state of Rigao. This, Your Honours, is further recognized by Article 34 of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, mm -hmm. which states that a treaty cannot impose obligations or rights on a third state without its consent. In this case, Your Honours, Operation Bug Attack occurred only on the territory uh, of the Council, Golden... Council, if I may interrupt, before you move on, uh, at the time of the occurrence of the alleged crimes, yes. was the Golden Lowlands part of Giska? Yes, Your Honour. So did Giska have jurisdiction over that territory at the time of occurrence of the crimes? Yes, Your Honour. However, Article 12.3 is, um, in effect, a state agrees to share with the court part of its jurisdictional powers that are inherent in its state sovereignty. As such, the retroactive effect, for example, of Article 12.3 in this case should not, should not be conflated with the timing of the acceptance of the court's jurisdiction, Article 12.2a. Even if the state of Giscar had the power to lodge its declaration on the Article 12.3, it's the precondition to exercise its jurisdiction in general on the Article 12. As such, it must prove that either the conduct in question occurred on the territory of Giscar or that its nationals were involved in the incident. However, in this case, the conduct in question, Your Honours, occurred in the territory of the Golden Lowlands, which currently falls outside the jurisdiction of Giscar. Therefore, we argue that in 2022, Giscar lacked the power to file this declaration. That may be so. However, at the time of occurrence of the crimes, at least what Article 12 says, is the crime occurred on the territory of the state in question. So at the time of occurrence of the crimes, the territory belonged to Giska. So why should a different interpretation be given here with regard to assessing jurisdiction at the time of issuing the declaration rather than assessing jurisdiction at the time of occurrence of the crimes? Your Honor, again, we would like to reiterate to the fact that Article 12 is the precondition for the exercise of the court jurisdiction. As such, when a state, such as in, the, in our case, the state of Giscar, files a declaration under Article 12.3, it must trigger the exercise of jurisdiction of the court under Article 12.2. In, during, during the lodging of the declaration, it must prove that it he either has territorial jurisdiction or personal jurisdiction over the matter. Thank you. Do you have any precedents to, to uh, back up that argument? Yes, Your Honor. As uh, we have previously reiterated to the, to the Myanmar decision, it was precisely in this decision in which the court guided us how to, how to interpret Article 12, which is the exact delegation of states' domestic jurisdiction over the court. If we, if we can infer from this case, the state of Giscar only delegates what it has domestically under its jurisdiction. Thank you. If you have no further questions, I will proceed with summarizing my main point, namely that uh, exercising jurisdiction in the present case would be also inconsistent with Article 34 of the Vienna Convention. In this case, Your Honours, Operation Bug Attack occurred only on the territory of the Golden Lowlands, which is part of Regal's territory. Moreover, the people involved in the operations were nationals of the state of Regal, the Republic, however, is neither a state party to the Rome Statute, nor has accepted the court's jurisdiction. Exercising the jurisdiction of the court in the present case would undermine Regal's exclusive right to exercise jurisdiction and to try this case nationally for crimes which were committed on its territory by its nationals, despite its non-consent in the present matter. If you have no further question, Your Honours, I will proceed with the second submission of the counsel for the defendant, namely that the court lacks subject matter jurisdiction under Article 71K of the Rome Statute. The defense addresses two arguments to support this. 
Firstly, the alleged acts do not satisfy the necessary elements of crimes against humanity under Article 71K. Three main submissions will support this. My first submission is that the acts did not inflict serious injury to the physical and mental health of the population of the Golden Lowlands. Your Honours, the threshold of such act is very high, comparable to that of rape or torture, for example. As such, acts such as forced marriages or forced nudity have previously reached this high threshold established in the ICC jurisprudence. Therefore, in Blaskic, the appeals chamber ruled that physical and mental health suffering as a result of being denied access to food does not in itself qualify as such act. It must be accompanied by other aggravating factors, which in the Blaskic case were example the lack of medical care, sanitary facilities, cruel treatment, and beatings. Therefore, the death of 25,000 people in the present case, as unfortunate as it is, does not in itself qualify as such act and cannot by itself constitute an act which inflicted great suffering or serious injury to the physical and mental health of the population. Council, if I may ask, then what is the threshold here? How many people have to die for it to be considered an other inhumane act here? Your Honour, this is not a quantitative assessment in this case. If we look at the elements of crime in Article 71K, we will see that Article 71K requires that the great suffering is caused by, by the perpetrator's act. And as established by the previous jurisprudence, for example, in the Stackage case, this requires a direct causation of the great suffering to the victim. However, in our case, such nexus and such direct causation simply does not exist. Your Honours, the purported qualities in this case cannot be reasonably and directly attributed to the release of the genetically modified insects. Nothing in the case facts establish, establishes a direct causal link between the harm experienced by the victims and the acts being imputed to the defendant. Case facts do not directly establish sufficiently how due to Operation Bug Attacks actions, the region's economy collapsed, the prices quadrupled, the people could not afford food, how they died of starvation, how they committed suicide. We, said, we see that this is a very remote link. However, if we look at previous jurisprudence, for example, in the ICTY the Lalich case, the directness was established when the perpetrator produced a burning fuse cord to the victim's skin. As such, we see the, the precise directness that we need in the case, skin to skin, if we may say. However, in our case, due to the remote link of the defendant's actions, we cannot say that the act in itself inflicted the great suffering or serious injury to the population. A question for counsel. Um, you seem to talk about immediacy and not directness. So what other cause, if not the acts committed, allegedly committed by the defendant, caused these deaths, despite any, you know, geographical closeness has never been an impediment to link um, the perpetrator with the crimes committed, especially in international crimes. Yes, Your Honor. However, we tend to disagree that we talk about immediacy rather than directness. We, we reiterate again the Delalic case in which the direct causation of the harm of the victim by the perpetrator's act was established. This is a very direct, reasonably attributed link between the perpetrator's act and the harm that was caused by the victim. In our case, we have the release of genetically modified insects. Then if we look at the IM report, which in my third submission, I will conclude that it's inadmissible and in any case, it cannot satisfy the standard of proof. But either way, the case facts in our case do not establish how specifically the genetically modified insects were released, how the economy collapsed, what was the direct result of the crash of the economy, the quadruple of the prices, how how in the span of 18 months people couldn't afford food, how this all led to 20,000 people dying of starvation and 5,000 committing suicide. This is again, and I reiterate, a very, very remote link. 
if Counsel, if I may interrupt. If we take this, go through the sta facts step by step. Operation bug attack released genetically modified bugs. Crops in, Gis in the Golden Lowlands failed. Economy collapsed. 20,000 people died of starvation. 5,000 people committed suicide. Why is that not possession enough? Your Honor, in our case, again, we reiterate that the defendant's action did not cause the serious injury. And in any case, the act was not foreseeable and did not satisfy the subjective elements under Article 71K, but also was not of a similar character to other crimes against humanity under Article 71. As such, in any case, it does not satisfy the objective and subjective elements under Article 71K. When you're telling us the act was not foreseeable, are you telling us the bugs were released unintentionally or the perpetrator did not foresee the harm that was ultimately caused? No, Your Honor. In our case, we argue that, um, that I'm sorry, uh, the defendant's actions did not cause great suffering or serious injury intentionally, which requires both the conduct and consequences intense as established by Article 30 of the Rome Statute, and more specifically, Article 32B, which requires a person to possess the mental element if he either means to cause the consequences or he is aware that such consequences will occur in the ordinary course of events. More specifically, we believe that the defendant was clearly unaware with practical certainty that the consequences would certainly follow from his actions. If, for example, we look at Appendix 3, Paragraph 6 of the case facts, the bioengineered insects in our case were focused solely on corn, potato, and cotton crops of the region. They do not target all of the food sources. They do, did not affect the whole production in the region. As such, the accused could not have foreseen the extent of widespread casualties or the 5,000 suicides that happened in the span of 18 years. The defense contends that intending to cause economic hardship in Counsel, this case. you have five more minutes. Yes, thank you. Um, if you have no further questions, I will proceed with the third submission of the counsel for the defendant, namely that the IIM report is an inadmissible piece of evidence and in any case is insufficient to meet the standard of proof under Article 61.7. Firstly, the defense argues that the admission of the IIM report is in inconsistent with Article 69.4 of the Rome Statute. This provision allows the court to rule on the admissibility of evidence, considering its probative value and any prejudicial effect it might have on the right to a fair trial. As established by the pretrial chamber in the Bemba case, probative value encompasses the source, reliability, and credibility of the piece of evidence. Referring to these three specific elements, the defense contends that the IM report lacks any probative value. Particularly, the IM report as the source of evidence, was produced by an illegitimately created body. The IM's establishment by the General Assembly, Your Honors, was an ultra virus act. The General Assembly conferred enforcement and prosecutorial powers upon it, which only a Security Council subsidiary body may possess. In this case, the creation of criminal files, drafting indictments, and compelling state cooperation are something that, for example, the ICTY and the RCTR have been doing, which, however, the UN General Assembly lacks inherently under the UN Charter. The illegitimate nature of the IAM has been further contested even by UN official, namely the UN Under Secretary General. Moreover, the Council, reliability... Council, is the opinion of the UN Secretary, the Secretary General in this case binding? No, Your Honor. However, Very this... Well. This emphasizes the fact that not only is it unlawful under the UN Charter, but the fact that it's illegitimate is further recognized by another UN official. If I may interrupt, Counsel. Is establishing the IIM ultra-vires or some of the tasks or terms of reference that was given to the IIM, was that ultra-vires? 
Your Honor, in this ca case, the defense does not challenge the creation of a subsidiary body by the General Assembly. As we know, it has the power to do, do so under Article 22 of the UN Charter, Charter, and it's not a novel occurrence by the General Assembly to do so, as it was already established in the case of Myanmar and Syria, for example, when it established its investigative mechanisms. However, in doing so, the previous subsidiary bodies of the General Assembly only had the power to submit evidence, to analyze it, to gather it. This was their mandate. In our case, the mandate that was given by, to, the IAM, to the IAM by the General Assembly uh, did not inclu include power to draft indictments and create criminal files, which inherently the General Assembly lacks under the UN Charter. This is what we're challenging. If I may, however, so what you're saying is drafting of a fact-finding report in and of itself is, not, is, is within the mandate of the IAM, and also creating a body to do that is also within the mandate of the General Assembly. Your Honor, the General Assembly can ex establish subsidiary bodies, can establish investigative mechanisms under Article 22 of the UN Charter, but also under the Uniting for Peace. However, previous investigative mechanisms never had the power to draft indictments, create criminal files, or compel state cooperation. And the practice of the ad hoc tribunals has indicated that the drafting of indictments and the creation of criminal files falls under the role of a prosecutor, which is done upon finding that a prima facie case exists against the suspect, which, again, these ad hoc tribunals were the creation of the UN Security Council, not the UN General Assembly. But then the next question would be, this report, the report in question, is not a case file, is not an indictment. It's a fact-finding report. So Pre why should this piece of evidence or this document be excluded under Article 69? Your Honor, we argue that precisely because of the source of the report, the IAM was produced by an illegitimately cr created body, it lowers the probative value of the report. And as we will see, the reliability and the credibility of the IAM report are severely compromised by the fact that the only witness who provided the information in the report, Kristen Cole, is absent from the proceedings. Therefore, the defense cannot even challenge the testimony of the only witness who provided the content of the IAM report. Being, I will give you 30 more seconds to finish that sentence. Thank you. The defense would like to summarize its main point also that the IAM report is in itself insufficient to meet the standard of proof under Article 61.7 of the Rome Statute which states that there must be substantial grounds to believe that the person committed each of the charged crimes. The defense points out that the IAM report is an indirect piece of evidence. And referring to the pretrial chamber ruling in Bemba, a decision on the confirmation of charges cannot be based solely on one such piece of indirect evidence. All right, counsel. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Very well. All right, so now we have counsel for the prosecution. Madam President, Your Honors, may it please the court. My name is Rafaela Freitas, and along with my co-counsel, Laura Lira, I speak on behalf of the Office of the Prosecutor in the case against Mr. Corliss Valerian of the state of Rigueo. Your Honors, the defendant is being charged for conceiving and implementing an operation that seized the access to food of one million people. The attacks that were frequently carried out destroyed 65% of the crops farms of the Golden Lowlands, a region of the state of Jiskar, a developing economy with an agro-based economy. Your Honors, this destruction led to 5,000 suicide, I apologize, yeah, 5,000, I'm sorry, Your Honors, 5,000 suicides of farmers and 20,000 deaths by starvation of the civilians. Even as the consequences unfolded, not only the defendant frequently carried out the bio area releases through one year and six months, but all along he held the access to bioengineer crops that could end the suffering of the civilian population, but chose not to share it until they signed 
a merger agreement that would establish that in exchange of these bioengineered crops, they would have to merge with the state of Regale and pay 10% tax rate over all of its future exports. Before you continue, I have three questions I want you to consider. One, what is the direct link between the 20,000 deaths and the act of the defendant? Two, the 5,000 suicides. Again, same question, what is the direct link? As well as, thirdly, any evidence you have with respect to the knowledge of the defendant that this was going on, that people were dying, that people were committing suicide. Keep that in mind as you submit, please. Your Honours, I will therefore answer your question as I plead. Therefore, the Office of the Prosecutor does not intend to indiscriminately broaden the scope of the Rome Statute, but to strictly apply it. And thus, maintaining the decision that confirmed the charges against the defendant. Therefore, the Office of the Prosecutor will be making three main submissions. First, that there was a crime against humanity of other inhumane acts, since all of the material and mental elements are met. Second, that there is jurisdiction over the present case, since the Article 12 3 declaration is valid. And third, that there is legitimate and sufficient evidence in the situation at hand. Madam President, in order to primarily assess your doubt, I would like to first argue the subject matter jurisdiction, if it pleases the court. In the sense, Your Honors, the Office of the Prosecutor states that the charges of the defendant are of crimes against humanity of other inhumane acts since it meets all of the material and mental elements. In the sense, I would like to assess first the direct link between the acts of the defendant and the consequences felt. Your Honors, the 20,000 deaths were in relation to the destruction of the crops farms. The Golden Lowlands is a developing economy with an agro-based economy. Your Honors, the exports of the Golden Lowlands refer to 5% of the whole world production. It was the dependency of the economy and sustenance of the people of the Golden Lowlands. When attacking its crop, the prices of food quadruplied, and thus people starve, leading to the 20,000 deaths by starvation. That may be so or not. My question is, how do you link that directly to the actions of the defendant? Madam President, the defendant conceived and implemented the Operation Bug Attack. He was the CEO of Corexis Corporation, the only corporation that holds the patent of the bioengineer bugs. Therefore, we can link his actions of conceiving and implementing the operation with the effects felt by the population of the Golden Lowlands. Council, if I may ask a follow-up on that. How, what evidence is there to, sh to show, now one, that Operation Bug attack, the consequences of the attack, allegedly, were foreseeable, and two, what evidence is there to show that the that defendant actually intended for the deaths and the suicides to occur? Your Honours, in order to answer your question, I would like to make two main points. Firstly, the Office of the Prosecutor argues that the defendant had the intent to cause great suffering. Your Honours, in paragraph 6, it is stated that the, of the IIM, it is stated that Operation Bug Attack had a two-folded object to first significantly suppress the farm output of the Golden Lowlands, to then second, induce the population to succeed and join Regale the only states that had the bioengineer crops. In this sense, the defendant could have never met its second object if the population had not perished and starved. 
Furthermore, even if this honorable court does not consider the direct intent, the Office of the Prosecutor states that Article 30 encompasses dollars directives of second degree, which states that the defendant must have the intent on the conduct, which is implementing an operation that releases bioengineer bugs, which was met in the present case, but foresee the consequence. They would be the most inevitable outcomes. Your Honors, I would like to make a comparison with the case in Kenyatta. The pretrial chamber stated in that case that by leading a group to invade a city in revenge, Mr. Kenyatta would be accepting that the foreseeable consequence would be the rape of the civilians. That was the link between the actions of Mr. Kenyatta and the foreseeable consequence. In the case at hand, when we make a comparison, destroying the crops of an agro-based economy, the foreseeable consequence is that people will starve and perish. Moreover, in regards to the knowledge of the defendant as the consequences unfolded, we see that the state of Rigueo funded a secession movement. Therefore, the state of Rigueo was aware of the agitation in the Golden Lowlands, and the defendant is the CEO of an owned and controlled company of the state of Rigueo. Your Honors, the merger agreement is stated as a condition that they would give access to the bioengineer crops if the Golden Lowlands merged with the state of Rigueo. It was a plan with its, all of its objectives well defined. And not only the defendant was aware, but he intended for the suffering to happen. If not, he could never met his final object. Moreover, in regards to Madam, questions, pre Madam President's question, in regards to the 5,000 suicides. Your Honor, once more bring in the Kenyatta case. In the pretrial chamber, it was stated that loss of property may be considered as inflicting mental suffering if we have the information regarding the victims of this mental suffering. And in the case at hand, we do have this information. 5,000 farmers committed suicide due to the loss of its farms. What evidence do you have that the reason for the suicide or suicides was the action of the defendant? Will, are you certain there were not other issues? How can you be so affirmative? Madam President, the Office of the Prosecutor states that in the stage of the proceedings, the threshold is substantial grounds to believe. And with all of the circumstances surrounding the case at hand, and considering the fact that the information that the actions of the defendant led to the effects of 5,000 suicides of farmers was an information of the IIM, an investigative mechanism created by United Nations Authority, and that the evidence was assessed by United Nations staff, we can see that there is, in this threshold of the pretrial confirmation, of the pretrial confirmation, the substantial grounds to believe. Your Honours, I believe I answered your questions in regards to the 5,000 um, suicides, the 20,000 deaths by starvation, and also the foreseeable consequences and the intent of the defendant. Therefore, the Office of the Prosecutor would also like to state that it meets the other elements. It is a widespread and systematic attack against a civilian population, since it is directed to the right to food. It directly seized the human right to food of the civilian population. Moreover, it was through an organizational policy, since the Caraxes Corporation has the means to bring about the attack that inflicted into great suffering upon the population. Moreover, the Office of the Prosecutor also states that it inflicted great harm, and we cannot state, as it was stated by the Defense Counsel, the Office of the Prosecutor respectfully disagree. 25,000 causalities indeed confirm that it was great 
harm inflicted upon the population. Moreover, the Office of the Prosecutor also states that it is of similar nature and gravity to other crimes enlisted, since serious human rights were violated and the right to food was seized and limited, therefore being similar to the crime of extermination and also persecution. Therefore, your honors, I would like to move forward to my second submission, that there is jurisdiction over this court since Article 12.3 declaration was valid. Your honors, the Article 12.3 declaration has a retroactive aspect that is well established. In the situation in Côte d'Ivoire, it was accepted in Article 12.3 declaration with its retroactive aspect. In this sense, the Defense Council brought forward the case in Myanmar. However, your honors, the case in Myanmar specifically states that it is sufficient for a state to grant jurisdiction if there's a link between its territory and the crime committed. And in the case at hand, we see that there is this link. The Golden Lowlands were part of the state of Jiskar when the crimes were committed. Moreover, the Defense Council also argued that it would be a violation of Article 34 of the Vienna Convention if we accepted the jurisdiction under the present case. However, Your Honors, also in the situation in Myanmar, it was stated that Article 34 is not absolute. In some occasions, this court may have effects on states not party and that would be still in consistence with principles of international law. Moreover, even if we assess the situation of secession, which would differ from the usual Article 12.3 declaration situations that were previously mentioned, such as the situation in Cote d'Ivoire, we can still apply the jurisdiction of this court in regards to the criteria of international recognition. Your Honours, in the situation in Georgia, the South Ossetian territory had declared as independence. However, after the independence was declared, the Georgia state has urged this court to exercise its jurisdiction over crimes committed in the South Ossetian territory. Your Honours, this court affirmed its jurisdiction, even though the South Ossetian territory had declared its independence, and it based its decision on the fact that only four states had come forward to recognize the independence of South Ossetia. Your Honours, in the case at hand, so far, no state has come forward to recognize the independence of the Golden Lowlands. However, 130 states have voted to create an investigative mechanism and 38 states referred the case to this honorable court. Counsel, if I may, just because an IAM has been created or a situation has been referred to the court, that does not in and of itself mean that states do not recognize the independence and the merger of the Golden Lonans with Regal. Also, the question is, according to Article 6 of the Constitution of Giskar, a territory is allowed to secede, and they seem to have done it legitimately, and Giskar does not seem, at least with regard to the evidence before us, seem to contest that. So why is this case similar to Georgia, where international com community did not give recognition to the secession? Your Honor, I'll be happy to clarify. Firstly, we state that along with the fact that so far no state had come forward to recognize it, we can analyze that 130 states voting for the creation of the IIM and the 38 referrals would inform that there is expectancy of the international community that the crimes committed in the Golden Lowlands are judged by this court therefore showing that there is expectancy of international community that justice is brought to the people of the Golden Lowlands and thus that the secession would be through illegal means. Moreover, the Office of the Prosecutor would also like to state that the conduct in question was not solely committed in the Golden Lowlands. Your Honours, if we look to paragraph 6 of the IIM, we can see that the release of bioengineer bugs was in the Cascading River side of the state of Jiskar. Your Honours, when we look at the map, 
we can see that the Cascading River not only borders the Golden Lowlands, but also the Iron Highlands, which is still uncontestably a part of the state of Giscard. Therefore, if we apply strictly the Article 12.2a, as it was stated by the Defense Council, we could still exercise jurisdiction since the conduct was also committed in the Iron Highlands. Moving forward now to my last submission. The Office of the Prosecutor states... Counsel, before you move on, on this fact that you just raised, is there any evidence before us to show that the actions and acts and conducts of the accused also occurred in the Iron Highlands? And what consequences were there on the Iron Highlands? Your Honours, I would like to answer your question and then move forward to my third submission. It is in the IIM stating that the bioengineer release was in the Cascading River side of the state of Giscard. And the Cascading River side of the state of Giscard also borders with the Iron Highlands. Moreover, only the conduct can be committed. There's no special definition that the effect would also have to be committed. Since Article 12.2a states that we have jurisdiction over the state where the conduct was committed, and also the situation in Myanmar stated that if one of the elements of the crime is present, this court can exercise jurisdiction. Moving forward to my final submission. Your Honours, the Uniting for Peace resolution was created legitimately by Article 22 of the United Nations Charter to encompass situations that, by the indiscriminate use of the veto, the United Nations Security Council fails to act. Your Honours, that was exactly the case at hand. The state of Jisker correctly resorted to the United Nations Security Council asking for measures to be committed. However, it was vetoed by a close ally of the state of Regale. Therefore, Your Honours, correctly it resorted to the Uniting for Peace resolution. And the creation of the IIM is a well-established practice under international law. Your Honours, there is the investigative mechanism of Syria that has very similar powers to the one at hand. We have the capacity of dra draft indictments. Moreover, there's the investigative mechanism in Ukraine, in Palestine, in Myanmar, which was also accepted as evidence in this honorable court. Moreover, your honors, the office of the prosecutor states that even if the courts considered that prosecutorial powers should not have been given to the IIM, in the case at hand, they are not being used. It is a de facto investigative mechanism. It is being used as a piece of evidence, and therefore it is not sufficient to render the inadmissibility of the evidence. Counsel, last question on that point. Even if those methods, the, the report is a fact-finding report, but would the fact that the terms of reference of the IAM is different, would that affect its methodology of collecting the evidence, and therefore the, affecting the credibility and reliability of that evidence? Your Honours, we state that it would not. In the Katanga case, it was stated that documents signed by United Nations members are presumed authenticated. Therefore, since some of the elements were assessed, fined, and also confirmed by United Nations staffs, we can rely on its information. Your Honours, the Office of the Prosecutor would like to thank the time given. All right, so you, your time is finished, but I have one question. The actual declaration, it's open-ended. It says that the declaration is made for an indefinite duration, the Article 12, Subsection 3 declaration. Does that invalidate it? No, Madam President, that does not invalidate it. It can be an open-ended declaration. Basis? Your Honor, that was also accepted in other situations. For example, in Ukraine, it is an open-ended declaration. Very well. All right. Thank you. And now, we will hear from the representatives of the government of Giska. Thank you very much for giving me the floor. Madam President, Your Honor, my name is Marie Voidmans, and alongside with my co-counsel, Elene Bukachadze, we are honored to send before this court today to represent the state of Giscard in the appeal against Corles Valeron 
of the Republic of Regalia. Today, we unite with a resolute purpose to achieve justice for the 20,000 people who starved to death in the Golden Lowlands and the 5,000 desperate farmers who ended their lives. This distressing case will serve as a stark reminder, highlighting the inherent vulnerability of human beings, the human dependency and the importance of nature, and the awful things greed make people do. These pleadings will be based on three submissions, Your Honours. Firstly, the declaration made by Giscard pursuant to Article 12.3 was valid. Secondly, arguments are going to be raised in favor of the qualification of Mr. Valeron's acts as ecocide in the formation of crimes against humanity under Article 7.1k. And thirdly, the IAM's report of 6 April 2022 is admissible and provided sufficient evidence to confirm the charges against the defendant. The first submission that's going to be analyzed in depth is a submission on the confirmation of the validity of the Lodge Declaration pursuant to Article 12.3 made by Giscard. The validity is based on the fact that the Golden Lowlands are still part of the territory of Giscard. The Defense Council states that the Golden Lowlands legally seceded from Giscard and merged with Regale, but this is a point where the Government Council of Giscard strongly wants to oppose to. No secession, no transfer of sovereignty or jurisdiction have occurred. Firstly, Your Honours, because the state of Giscard did not consent it with the independence. And secondly, as subsidiary argument, the declaration of acceptance pursuant to Article 12.3 is valid due to the retroactive application of Article 12.3. Um, I have a question, Council. Um, wasn't there a plebiscite? that then led to the succession. That's true, Your Honor. And I will come back to the plebiscite in a minute, because we also have a problem with the plebiscite. The invalidity of the Declaration of Independence is based on the lack of any kind of agreement between the Golden Lowlands and Giscard as parent state. And customary law also shows that a secession is only completed after an agreement with the parent state. A reference can be made to Macedonia, Montenegro and South Sudan, who all legally seceded after an agreement from their parent state. Or reference can be made to Catalonia, which is still not recognized as an independent state due to the refusal of Spain. And it's correct, Your Honor, that indeed Article 6 of the Giscarian Constitution of 2002 provides a right to all semi-autonomous regions to secede after a two-third majority vote in a plebiscite. But, Your Honours, could this be interpreted as an anticipatory consent or even a legal plebiscite? The answer is simply no, because the plebiscite was invalid. The plebiscite violated the fundamental principles of human rights as enshrined in Article 25 of the ICCPR, which are also customary law. The rights to f the free expression of the will of the voter, the ability to vote free from intimidation, and the right to form opinions independently. The principles of the right to fair and free elections and that the plebiscite can be invalidated due to intimidation is international customary law, such as the principle that is enshrined in Article 1 of the ICCPR, which allows people to freely determine their political status. In the case at hand, the people of the Golden Lowlands were coerced. There was an independence movement active in the region of the Golden Lowlands, which were funded by the Republic of Regali. And that independent movement coerced the civilian Council. population. Council, the independent movement, didn't it exist before Regal's assistance, according to you? Your Honor, we don't have any facts about when the independence movement was created. Very well. So then, how can you assert that the independence movement was, was only as a result of the actions of Regal. The independence movement was funded by Regali, and therefore they got a lot of support. But the funding of Regali, of this independent movement, is an intervention. Because according to the ICJ in the Nicaragua case of 1986, paragraph 241, 
the funding of an independence movement to overthrow a government can be considered as a form of intervention. Just like in the case of Nicaragua, where the US funded the Contras, the independent movement of the Contras, in the case at hand, Regale funded the independence movement of Giscard. And according to paragraph 205, direct interventions by states in international affairs of states is strictly forbidden. And therefore, the government council of the state of Giscard strongly urged at the fact that the plebiscite was invalid since the people of the Golden Lowlands were coerced. And a subsidiary argument. Council, with regard to coercion, how do you connect funding of an independence movement to people in the Golden Lowlands being forced, according to coercion, coerced into voting in a plebiscite for independence? The funding alone was not, the, uh, the funding of the independent movement and the independent movement itself was not the only thing that coerced the civilian populations. By the acts of the defendant, the civilians of the Golden Lowlands were in fact put with their back against the wall. They could not do anything. They did not have a prospect for a better near future unless they voted positive on the plebiscite merged with Regale and then got the patents for the uh, bioengineered seeds which are, uh, they could resist the bioengineered insects that were released by Caraxes Corp on the territory of the Golden Lowlands. Council wasn't there, if I remember correctly, a five month period between the independence and the um, accession to Regal? It was not immediate, was it? Uh, I will come later back in my rebuttal on the answer of this question. I need to gather my thoughts about, what, about your question. But as subsidiary argument, the state of Giscard wants to raise the fact that even if the court is of the consideration that the Golden Lowlands legally seceded from Giscard and merged with Regali, the declaration pursuant Article 12.3 is still valid due to the retroactive application of Article 12.3. The ICC has recently and very importantly recognized in the situation over the crimes committed in Crimea, the possibility for a state to lodge a declaration in the case of uh, Crimea, Ukraine, which includes territories that are no longer part of the state making a declaration. This means in the case at hand that the state of Giscard can extend its jurisdiction even though the Golden Lowlands are to be considered as regalist territory. This precedent shows that the court recent praxis confirms that the state that has sovereignty over the territory at the time of the commission of the crimes has jurisdiction over the crimes. And this can also be derived out of the interpretation of the wordings of Article 12.2a of the statute, which puts the focus on the territory where the crimes occurred. The 1998 Travaux Préparatoires of Article 12.3 and the previous lodged declarations pursuant Article 12.3, for example, in Uganda and Côte d'Ivoire, they all show that the non-party acceptance mechanism pursuant Article 12.3 is retroactive in nature. And lastly, 38 states referred this case to the ICC, so almost 40 states are of the opinion that the ICC has jurisdiction to, uh, to uh, rule over the matter in the Golden Lowlands. Yes. Council, but however, the examples that you cite from Cote d'Ivoire are different in the sense that Giscard has lost control, at least effectively, of the Golden Lowlands. And how would you respond to the defendant's arguments regarding the Myanmar pretrial chamber decision on jurisdiction? Your Honor, about the effective control. In the case of Ukraine, Ukraine also lost its sovereignty, uh, its effective control over the territory of Crimea. Still, the court considered that Ukraine had the, the uh, of was allowed to lodge a declaration of 12.3, which was legal so that the ICC can rule over the matter in Crimea. And also in Georgia, also in the t on the territory of South Ossetia, the, o the uh, ICC ruled that even though the territory of South Ossetia was under effective control of Russia, uh, Georgia still had the right to lodge a declaration under Article 12.3, which was valid. 
Therefore, to sum up, Your Honours, the court has jurisdiction to prosecute the crimes committed in the Golden Lowlands prior to the Declaration of Independence on 15 January 2021. An OBA was implemented between March 2019 and September 2020, so consequently the court has jurisdiction to rule over the matters that occurred on the Golden Lowlands. And as second submission, the second submission that's going to be analyzed is a submission on the qualification of the acts committed by Mr. Valeron as ecocide in the formation of Article 71K of the Rome Statute. Since March 2019, Giscard has been haunted by OBA, which was implemented by Caraxis. OBA repeatedly aerial released bioengineered insects on the Giscarian side of the Cascading River. And this resulted in the destruction of 65% of the crops and the death of 25,000 inhabitants. So considering these facts, Mr. Valeron as creator and implementer of OBA is to be held responsible for ecocide under Article 71K. However, Your Honours, ecocide is not yet an autonomous prosecutable crime under the Rome Statute. It's very important today, two days after the Environmental Day, that we label these crimes as ecocide, to put the focus on human dependency and the nature and, and the value of nature. Your Honours, the requirements for crimes against humanity are fulfilled. Why? Firstly, because the contextual elements are established, and secondly, the acts qualify as an other inhumane act under Article 71K. Council, is this court entitled to list ecocide, though it is not part of the statute? Indeed, it is not part of the statute. However, the prosecutor charge the matters under ecocide under Article 71K. If we go to the Katanga judgment, paragraph 448, other inhumane acts are to be considered as violations of international customary law and violations of rights, uh, basic rights pertaining to human beings. In the case at hand, the right that were violated is the right to food and nourishment, the right to mental and physical health, which are all customary rules. So, in fact, the crimes that were committed are prosecutable under Article 71K. But the state of Giscard just wants to label these crimes as ecocide, because the state of Giscard really thinks that it is important that the court acknowledges that what happened in the Golden Lowlands is a form of ecocide. But the prosecution under Article 71K is required. Your Honor, I send the question. Counsel, thank you. Uh, if I may, the prosecution charge, the charge according to the prosecution was a form of ecocide. Uh, so is there a difference between ecocide and a form of ecocide as charged by the prosecution? Thank you, Your Honor, for your question. The government counsel of the uh, state of Giscar is of the opinion that there is just an ecocide. Crops were destroyed. People starved to death. The environment suffered from the bioengineered insects of the, uh, created by Caraxis Corp. So in the opinion of the government council of the state of Giscard, this was simply an ecocide in one of its gravest natures. Has ecocide been established in customary international law? Ecocide is not yet a crime under international customary law, but we see that it is an emerging crime under customary law. There is more and more vis vision in the legislation of states that they're all starting to prosecute or enshrining ecocide in their domestic legislation. So it's not yet a customary crime, but it's emerging. One question, Council. Regardless of what's happening in the present, we have to look at, at the Rome Statute and when it was, when it was signed in 1998. Do you have any information of what was said um, in the Rome Conference? Was there any discussion about such crimes? Um, because we have crimes against the environment as, as a war crime, but it is not included in crimes against humanity. And if we look at crimes against humanity, they're all directly inflicted in the person. So we don't have crimes against property or against 
your environment as, as you. Thank you, Honor, for your question. That was exactly my next point that I wanted to raise. The jurisprudence of the ICC has previously shown that the element of directed against the civilian population is to be considered as fulfilled when a civilian co population constitutes the primary object of the attack. So a sufficient nexus needs to be proven between the conduct and the consequences. And this could be established as a substantial cool standard. The nexus between an attack on an object and human suffering is clearly established in some international case law. During time, I'm just going to mention the cases where the nexus was established. For example, in Nikulic and Kuperiskic case, the Ongun case, the Katanga case, the Antaganda case, and the Kanyata case, they all cited that even if an attack is not physically against the civilian population, if there is a substantial nexus, the attack can be considered as an attack directed against the civilian population. So, Council, the next question, sorry, the next question would be, was there a substantial nexus in this case? Of course, Your Honor, there was a substantial nexus uh, in this case. Because if we go to the Bemba trial, uh, paragraph 123 and paragraph 213, the ICC determined that a substantial cause of the uh, alleged harm is required and that even the nexus requirement would be fulfilled when it's established that the crimes would not, that, uh, that the crimes would not have been committed without the actions of the accused. So, there if the actions of Mr. Valeron were not being done, there would not have been any suffering in the Golden Lowlands. We see a clear causal chain between the release of the bioengineered insects, the destruction of the crops, and the starvation of the civilian population. So in conclusion, the elements to qualify the acts as crimes against humanity are fulfilled. The last submission of the Government Council of Gisgar constitutes the confirmation of the decision of the pre-trial chamber that the IIM establishes substantial grounds to believe. Firstly, because the IIM was created legally, and secondly, there is reliable value of the evidence. The Defence Council stated that the IIM is illegal since there was a prosecutorial objective within the mandate of the IIM but the IIM had the sole goal of collecting information and that has been done. The IIM needed to make sure that no evidence disappeared, but no prosecution, enforcement or indictments have been undertaken. The General Assembly did not go beyond its mandate. This underlines that the draft indictments were seen as a sort of suggestion for the court. Otherwise, it would have said to prosecute instead of for prosecution as you can read in the IIM mandate. The IIM could just make some drafts, and even the IIM is not authorized or even capable to carrying out prosecutorial tasks. This needs to be done before the court and not before an investigative mechanism. Counsel, if I may, if the IIM is undertaking certain prose prosecutorial tasks, wouldn't that affect the neutrality of the IIM in its work? and therefore affect the credibility and reliability of its report as a neutral source of information and evidence? You mean if it had the uh, prosecutorial objectives? And tasks, which tasks. it has in this case. But in the case at hand, there were no prosecutable tasks. But I understand your concern, Your Honor, that if it has prosecutorial tasks, the neutrality would not be, uh, would not be um, confirmed. But there were no prosecutorial tasks and no indictments have even been undertaken. And secondly, the Defense Council also stated that the IIM is illegal since they urged the uh, states to cooperate with the IIM. But there was just to or to cooperate. There was nothing said about the states shall cooperate. Because the task of the United Nations General Assembly is to promote international cooperation for the maintaining of international peace and security. So they just put it like a sort of uh, suggestion for the uh, states to cooperate with the investigative mechanism, but there is no obligation in the wordings of the IIM that would state that the states were obliged to cooperate. And even if your honours are of the opinion that the IIM was created legally, with that I will end my plea and I will thank the court for giving me the floor. Thank you, Council.
All right, so we have heard the main arguments by the parties. We would now like to hear the replies in the same order that the arguments were presented in the first place. So to remind you, we will begin with the defense, then the prosecution, and then the representative of the government of Giska. As you do so, I have a question that I want all of you to consider. That is, no one has addressed us on the effect, if any, of the fact that at this moment, the whistleblower, Kristen Cole, has not been found. How does that affect the legitimacy of the report? All right. Defense, please, you have the floor. Good morning again, Madam President, Your Honors. In rebuttal, the Council for the Defendant focuses on three main points raised by both the prosecution and the State Council. The defense's first point considers both the prosecution and the State Council's submission that the court has territorial and temporal jurisdiction over the crimes since the secession of the Golden Lowlands was invalid. However, the defense particularly challenges this argument. Specifically, the case law provided, for example, by the prosecution in the situation of Georgia or in the situation of Crimea. Your Honours, we do recognize that there are a handful of situations in which the court previously recognized that former territories are still part of the territorial jurisdiction of its former state. However, it, in these cases, it always involved an unlawful use of force. For example, in the situation of Georgia, it was the unlawful Russian intervention. In the situation of Crimea, it was against the unlawful military attack of Russia. However, in our case, as per paragraph 2, we can see that Article 6 of the Giscard Constitution specifically allows for the domestic right of any of the region of the Golden Lowlands to lawfully secede if they fulfill the specific requirements and to realize their right and external right to self-determination. As such, we cannot talk about unlawfulness in any case. If, the so if I may, generally the practice in international law has been to defer to the state to assess whether a particular territory seceded legally or not. So in this situation, why should we discount what the government of Giscard is claiming here and not defer to them? Your Honours, we would like to point you to the fact that the Golden Lowlands has become an independent state from the 15th of January 2021 to the, to the 15th of May 2021. There has been more than five months in which the state of Giscard could have raised its, uh, its concerns. It could have claimed sovereignty over the Golden Lowlands. It could have expressed its uh, public voice as to whether or not the international community should recognize that the Golden Lowlands is an unlawfully seceded territory. This is very contradictory to the previous hostile claims by, for example, Spain and Catalonia, in which a state does not recognize that a territory has lawfully seceded. In this case, for these five months, Giscard has not raised this issue before the international community. As such, we do not see any problem in this matter. If I'm oh, so sorry. So because the state of Giscard had not raised it before, are they now stopped from doing so? No, Your Honor, we do, not, we do not claim that the state of Giscard does not have this right. However, for the last five, in between these five months, and even the established agenda of the, previous, the present appeals chamber does not consider the legality of the secession of the Golden Lowlands. It considers whether the court has territorial and temporal jurisdiction over the alleged crimes. Exactly, Counsel, because this court does not have the authority to assess whether a territory legally or illegally seceded from its host state, home state. So here, why should we not again defer to the state? Your Honor, again, I would like to re reiterate to the fact that the case law of this court has recognized such former territories. Even if we look at the case of Palestine, the court has recognized that the occupied Palestinian territories, disputed borders, disputed territories, are part of the state of Palestine because they are part of the sovereign territory of the Palestinian people. However, in this case, the court further recognized that any other extension would encroach upon the, the sovereign territory of Israel, thereby being aware where to, where to exercise its jurisdiction. In our case, we don't have a disputed territory. We have part 
of the state of Rigao, which lawfully seceded, it exercised its right to self-determination without the unlawful use of force or without the, the uh, violation of the principle of non-intervention as raised by the prosecutor, for example, which used in this case the case of Nicaragua in which the ICJ uh, was found to violate this principle of non-intervention. However, Your Honor, we would like to reiterate you to the fact that the principle of non-intervention in general is a fairly vague concept under international law and the extent to which purely economic acts amount to a violation of this principle are largely undefined. I'd also like to, to point you to paragraph 245 of this, uh, of this case in which the massive economic sanctions and trade embargoes imposed by the U.S. to Nicaragua did not, however, amount to such an intervention. In our case, the acts of purely economic nature, the funding of the independence movements, as such, do not qualify. Therefore, we have a lawful secession, which does not violate any of the principles of general international law, as such, the Golden Lowlands should be recognized as a lawfully independent state and part of Rigel. Therefore, the court cannot exercise its territorial jurisdiction over the present case. We do not challenge the fact that retroactive effect can be given under Article 12.3. However, this retroactive effect should not be conflated with the principle of territorial jurisdiction. As further recognized, do delegating domestic jurisdiction is inherent under state sovereignty. Giscar, however, does not have this right. Therefore, only Regal has it. If I may proceed, uh, I would address the second submission of both the prosecution and the state council, namely that the elements of crimes against humanity were met in this case. Firstly, we would like to disagree with the state council that the crime should be charged as ecocide and that any of the remaining elements of the crimes fall within ecocide. We would like to reiterate you to the fact that the pretrial chamber reversed this and it pointed that the crime falls within crimes of other inhumane acts under Article 71K. As such, we would like again to point out that the objective elements of the crimes were not satisfied due to the fact that they did not inflict serious injury or great suffering to the mental and physical health of the population of the Golden Lowlands. Um, your Honor, in our case, the implementation of OBA destroyed and targeted solely crops. They do not involve physical violence, for example, in the case of ill treatment or direct beatings, which amounts to physical injury. Moreover, in the Mudhara case, the pretrial chamber found that the destruction of property and businesses cannot qualify as mental health suffering. In the similar vein, the destruction of crops and businesses as such cannot qualify. Therefore, we cannot speculate that the 5,000 suicides in this case should be considered as the mental health suffering caused by the perpetrator's actions. It's a but the 20,000 persons who starved to death? Your Honor. What about that? Your Honor, I understand your concern. However, we again would like to reiterate to our main pleadings that there is no direct link between the perpetrator's act due to the remoteness of his actions and the harm caused to the victims and the physical and mental health suffering which was imposed on them. As such, we would also like to point to the fact that the alleged acts are not of a similar character to other crimes against humanity. Your Honours, not all crimes, even if criminalized by national legislations, can be prosecuted as crimes against humanity. International criminal law focuses on atrocious and heinous acts. As such, the act of releasing designer insects is not violence nor a crime under general international law. Therefore, the prosecution and state council should be aware that other inhumane acts does not serve as a catch-all provision to criminalize every reprehensible conduct in this world. If I may also conclude my third submission and to point the question of your honor, uh, we would also like to point out that we disagree with the prosecution and the state council submission that the IM report is, a, is an admissible piece of evidence which satisfies the standard of proof. We would first like to answer the question of your honors. How does Kristen Coe's, uh, the fact that Kristen Coe is missing, um, is, is, has any impact on today's case? Your honor, 
Under Article 16.9.1e of the Rome Statute, the defendant has the right to make, to cross-examine and to have examined the witnesses against him, which was, which was this right, which encompasses an essential component of the right to a fair trial, was given a great weight by the appeal chamber in the Amber Shimana case. As Ko is missing, and we will again like to reemphasize the fact that she is the only witness who provided the content of the IAM report, no cross-examination is possible. The defense is unable to challenge the testimony of the only person that provided the information of the alleged proof against the defendant. Hence, to seek to confirm the charges only by the IAM report, which cannot be even supported by the right to a fair trial, is a serious violation of the right to the accused, thereby being extremely prejudicial and inconsistent with Article 69.4. Moreover, in any, in any case, Your Honor, the IM report in itself is insufficient to establish substantial ground to believe that the defendant committed each of the crimes charged as required under Article 61.7. Therefore, the IM report should not be admitted. Thank you. The reply of the prosecution, please. Madam President, Your Honors, I will now for 10 minutes address some of the main arguments brought forth by the Defense Council in regards to the 10 main points raised, subject matter jurisdiction, temporal and territorial jurisdiction, and third, in regards to the evidence. First, I will assess the subject matter jurisdiction. Your Honors, the Defense Council brought forth that in the Mutahara case, it was stated that economic damage uh, could not amount to harm. <coughs> However, Your Honors, the Mutahara case was dismissed because of the lack of evidence. In the same situation, in the Kenyatta case, it was stated that property of loss of property could amount to mental damage if there was information in regards to the victims who suffered that mental damage. And in the case at hand, we have this information. We have the fact that 5,000 farmers committed suicide. Moreover, we would like to state that 25,000 25, causalities are sufficient for great harm. Your Honors, once more bringing forth the situation in Kenyatta, four circum enforced circumcisions were considered as crimes of other inhumane acts. Therefore, it is not only limited to a quantitative analysis, but also a qualitative analysis. And in the case at hand, we see that it was a cruel attack that was frequently carried out and led to the secession of the Golden Lowlands and seized the actions to food of one million people. Moreover, Your Honors, it is of very similar nature to other crimes against humanity. In this sense, it diminished the right to food. As is stated in Article 25 of the Human Rights Convention, it is a recognized right and it was inflicted by the actions of the defendant. Moreover, we can also see that it was through the Ah. You saw my question coming. Uh, in terms of similarity, is it way too similar to extermination and therefore should have been charged as extermination and cannot be an other union act? Your Honours, we do not uh, state that it would be since it was uh, not through a limited group. It had attacking a whole population and it was through the means that makes the specific actions of the defendant different since it has other elements. Not only it was the 25,000 deaths, but also the starvation of one million people through the destruction of the access to food and the environment. Therefore, it has other elements that would make it encompassing to the Article 71K. And that would also bring me to my, uh, to my other argument, Your Honors. The Defense Council uh, stated that 71K article is not a catch-all provision. Your Honors, it was stated by the court in the Ongwen case that the defense should not resort to the declaration of the, a violation of the Nulla Crimi Sini ledge whenever there is 
an Article 71K allegation, since Article 71K by itself is pretty limited. Your Honours, Article 71K is not a broad provision. It's a limited provision. It has several elements that must be met. It must be widespread, systematic, directed against the civilian population through a state or organizational policy. There are several elements that must be met. That four, it's not a catch-all provision, is a well-limited provision. Now moving forward to my second point of rebuttal, I would like to address some of the arguments in regards to the territorial and temporal jurisdiction. Firstly, your honors, the defense counsel argued that in the situation in Palestine, this honorable court recognized the statehood of Palestine. However, your honors, in article 108 of the decision of Palestine, this honorable court specifically stated that it does not have the powers to decide on statehood. It is not on the subject matter jurisdiction of this court to make decisions whether a secession is legal or not, whether a state is recognized or not. Therefore, in the situation in Palestine, the court in paragraph 108 recognized that it was not making a decision on statehood, but it was merely applying the understanding of the United Nations General Assembly. And in the case, that would also what was happening in the situation in Ukraine. This court did not assess if it was an occupation. It applied the definition of the General Assembly that understood that it was an occupation. And similar, in the situation in South Ossetia, it did not assess if it was a legal independence. It applied international recognition. And in the case at hand, we have the international expectancy of this court to exercise jurisdiction under the present case. Your Honours, the interest of justice weights the rights of the defendant, the expectancy of the victims, and the expectancy of international community. And we have that expectancy in the case at hand. I would like to also point out once more that so far, no state has come forward to recognize the independence of the Golden Lowlands. Moreover, Your Honours, once more, the Defense Council argued that... Council, if I may. Uh you talk, you're talk, referring to expectancy of the General Assembly and the states by, through the reference of this issue, refer of this issue. However, if you take that into account, if the General Assembly really wanted to not recognize the secession and the merger of the Golden Lowlands with Regal, then they would have said so in their referral. Shouldn't we adduce something that the fact that they did not say anything about the statehood is the fact that international committee does not or thinks it's legitimate or does not challenge it at least? Your Honours, we state that it is a recent case. Therefore, not all of the definitions have been taken yet. However, we can see that the international community believes that it is within the jurisdiction of this court to try the defendant. Moreover, Your Honours, moving forward to my last ground of rebuttal, I would like to to rebut some of the arguments brought forth by the Defense Council in regards to the evidence. First and foremost, answering the question of Madam President in regards to Kristen Cole. Madam President, that would not change the sufficiency of the evidence in this present stage. In Article 61.5 of the Rome Statute, it is stated that the Office of the Prosecutor may rely solely on documentary evidence in the pretrial phase. Therefore, even if Kristen Cole cannot be cross-examined in this present case, we can still confirm the charges. Moreover, we state that, contrary to the arguments of the Defense Council, the evidence is not solely based in statements of Kristen Cole. It has a number of evidence that was brought forth by the IIM not only numbers that were directly assessed by staff members, but also informations that are of public access and knowledge. Your honors, the bioengineer crops and bioengineer bugs are solely owned and patent by Corexis Corporation. The defendant is also the CEO of Corexis Corporation. And in the merger agreement between the state of Rigel 
in the Golden Lowlands, which is a treaty. It was stated as an imposition that in order for the Golden Lowlands to gain access to the bioengineered crops that would end the, starva the starvation of the population, they would need to join Regale. Therefore, the evidence that surrounds the case at hand are not only limited to the information of Kristen Cole. Moreover, Kristen Cole provided authenticated notes that were analyzed by United Nations staffs. Therefore, we're not solely relying on the information provided by him, but on documents. In the sense, your honors, we state that it is sufficient in this phase of the proceedings. Your honors, the pretrial chase re requires substantial grounds to believe. We do not must offer, as was stated in Abu Garda, an overwhelming amount of evidence, and a specific amount of evidence, but sufficient evidence to establish a clear line of reasoning underpinning the allegations. And in the case at hand, we have the dates, the motives, the means, and the effects underpinning the allegations that a crime against humanity of other human acts was committed by the defendant and that it can be charged by this honorable court. Thank you, counsel. Thank you. All right, so now we will have the response by the representative of the government of Giscard. Madam President, your honors, thank you very much for giving me the floor once again. In this rebuttal, the state of Giscard wants to address four points. But firstly, I want to come back to a question previous asked to me about the five months period between the independence of the Golden Lowlands and the merger. But those five months actually are not relevant to the time frame. The goal of the, goal of the Republic of Regale wants, was to get the territory of the Golden Lowlands. But first, before, you get that, before he got the territory, the Golden Lowlands needed to secede from Giscard. And that was the first main point of interest of the Republic of Regale. Because the Republic of Regale really wanted the territory of the Golden Lowlands because Regale could never compete with the Golden Lowlands, with Giscar, on the agriculture basis of the land. The land, the ground, the soil of the Golden Lowlands were so fertile that Regale could never compete with the Golden Lowlands. So after the secession, they made everything in order for a merger five months later. But the time frame is not important in the case at hand, at what time the merger agreement was signed. What's important is that the Republic of Regale forced the people in the Golden Lowlands to secede from Kiskar. I hope this will suffice. Thank you, Your Honor. The first point of rebuttal is a reply on what the Defense Council stated. The Defense Council interpreted that the Government Council of the State of Kiskar is still pursuing with the charge of ecocide. But this, however, is not true. The Government Council of the State of Giscard is of the opinion that these crimes are other inhumane acts under Article 71K, and they need to be trialed under Article 71K. But the labeling is what's so important to us. But we are not saying that we are going to proceed with ecocide, because it is not a uh, prosecutable autonomous crime under the Rome Statute. As second point of rebuttal, the government council wants to jump at the intentional causing of great suffering or serious injury to body or to mental and physical health, as is as enshrined in Article 7, 1K of the Rome Statute. An OBA, OBA caused both significant harm to the physical health and to the mental health of the civilians of the Golden Lowlands. The death toll of 25,000 civilians is extremely high. And furthermore, long periods of starvation causes great degree of suffering, 
physical pain, vulnerability to diseases and high levels of stress, which all may lead to determine long-term consequences on someone's health. The extraordinary chambers of the Court of Cambodia ruled also in their douche case that the infliction of famine can constitute other inhumane acts since the gravity of the other inhumane acts because they cause so much suffering. Thirdly, the point that the defendant raised that we do not have an act of a similar character than the other crimes that can be retrieved out of Article 7. However, the acts committed in the Golden Lowlands show undoubtedly the same gravity and seriousness as the other crimes listed in Article 7. The citizens of the Golden Lowlands were deprived of their rights to adequate food, freedom from hunger, and their right to physical and mental health, which all resulted in the death of 20,000 people out of starvation and 5,000 people out of suicide. So the numbers actually speak for themselves. And the last point of rebuttal is an answer on the question raised by Madam President about the disappearance of the whistleblower, Mr. Cole. Indeed, it is true that because of the disappearance of Ms., uh, Mr. Cole, it's impossible for the chamber to cross-examine the, uh, the uh, Mr. Cole for the uh, reliability of the evidence to be uh, evidenced. But Article 61.5 of the Rome Statute allows the Office of the Prosecutor to rely on documentary or summary evidence and does not need to call the witness to testify at trial. The report of the IM can be considered as such a summary of the testimonies of Kristen Cole. And this got confirmed in, by the trial chamber of this court in the Lubanga case, paragraph 40, where it was stated that certain evidence, cor uh, certain documents corroborated by witness statements are admissible despite any oral testimonies. Furthermore, Rule 68.2c of the Rules of Procedure on Evidence say that if the prior recorded testimony comes from a person who died, can be assumed to have died, or due to obstacle cannot overcome uh, with reasonable diligence, is unavailable to testify before the court orally, because at this point we don't know where Mr. Cole is or what happened with Mr. Cole, the pretrial chamber may allow the introduction of the evidence of the previous recorded testimonies. And in Rule 68.1 of the Rules of Procedure and Evidence, it's stated that the pretrial chamber can admit transcripts or other documentary evidence of that prior given testimonies. With this, the Government Council of Giscard wants to end the rebuttal by a quick conclusion of the entire plea. The Government Council of the State of Giscard wants to urge the court to, firstly, consider or to determine that the ICC has jurisdiction to uh, prosecute the crimes committed by Mr. Valerom because of the retroactive application of Article 12.3. The acts committed by Mr. Valerom are other inhumane acts under Article 7.1k, and the IAM's report of 6 April 2022 is admissible and provides sufficient evidence. And with that, Your Honor, the Government Council of the State of Giscard wants to ask the court to bring back justice to the victims fell in the Golden Lowlands. Thank you very much for giving me the floor once again. Thank you very much, Council. Any questions? No? All right. All right, then. So thank you very much. We've heard all of the submissions. We will now rise to consider and to deliberate on our final ruling in this matter so that we anticipate that we should be back in court at 11.45. So for the participants, you may leave the court, but you must be back at that time at 11.45. It may be that we are not finished. And you may have to wait, but you must be back in case we are ready for that time. All right? Is that clear? Very well. All right, then.
Shall we then? All rise.